I've been working in the substance field for a long, long time. It's a brain issue. Inside of that, it's a dopamine issue. Weed, opiates, alcohol, cocaine, TikTok, porn, they all do the same thing. They dysregulate brain function. One, one of the things that was really interesting, well, people were talking about decriminalization as a solution to the overdose crisis, and that just simply isn't true. What's going on, everybody? When Rand came on there in the in the recording there and he started talking, I went shh in the microphone because I thought it was actually Rand talking. Uh. So I'm like, you're talking during the recording, Rand. So anyways. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. So anyways, that was tonight's guest. That was Rand Teed. I'm Daniel Unmanageable. This is Hard Knocks Talks coming at you from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Treaty Number no. 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis people. Let's bring in Rand. Hey, how are how you, Rand? Are you? I am well, thank you. So or how's like our Keith audio? Richard says, I'm happy to be anywhere. Hmm. I think he needs to be a bit louder. He needs to be a bit louder? Yeah. All right. There we go. Rand, is there anything that you'd like to say before we jump in tonight? No, I'm like I'm I'm happy to do this. I really like opportunities to uh, get some different ideas out there and get people thinking about things a little differently, so... We're ready to rock and roll. All right, man. Well, we're glad to have you. Let's jump in. This is Hard Knocks Talks. All right. Before we dive in, I'd just like to let our viewers and listeners know that tonight's live production is premier sponsored by Prairie Sky Recovery Center. Prairie Sky Recovery Center offers intensive inpatient addictions treatment in Leipzig, Saskatchewan. So, talking about what you said in the intro there about decriminalization. We can agree that harm reduction saves lives. Can we not? Absolutely. Yeah, like that's what it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. And it does that. Mm -hmm. uh, decriminalization is a kind of a separate issue, but roll with this one whatever way you want. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're, we're talking about survival I forget who I was talking to the other day and they said something like we need to meet people where they're at, but we can't leave them there. Yeah. And, and I really agree with that. Like I think what, when harm reduction first started, it was very uh, focused at helping people move from where they were to better degrees of wellness. Uh, often it was, you know, uh, providing needles, providing, uh, clean supplies, those kinds of things, which is really important because, like you said, we don't want people dying, yeah. and you can't you can't treat somebody who's dead, and so keeping people alive is really important. But I don't think it's particularly useful if that's all you're doing. Uh, yeah. You're actually helping them continue to be trapped in that level of addiction. So mm -hmm. if if it's a a, a focused constructive a path that helps them move to higher and higher levels of wellness. Uh, it doesn't have to always be total abstinence. And that's where a lot of the resistance came from when mm. people started to debate harm reduction because there, there are two camps were formed, the, the abstinent camp and the harm reduction camp. And, uh, you know, that was like eight or 10 years ago, there was some really hard divides there. But yeah. uh, both have softened quite a bit, and there's some pretty good conversations going on between both sides. Mm -hmm. And and even in the last few years, I've I've noticed myself the conversation is changing. In fact, um, and and I have her permission to say this. You know, even even the 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 executive director of Prairie Harm Reduction, Kayla Demong, uh, she she's she's a twelve stepper. You know, so the conversation is is certainly changing. But what else, like if, if survival isn't the end goal, how do we meter success? So what, what is, what is recovery to you? Well, uh, I, I think if we go back to, to, uh, how we, we help people, I think the most important thing we can do is, uh, help people understand that they are cared about. 
Uh, there's been a huge amount of stigma attached to addictions, and, and a lot of that's internalized by the people uh, who have addictions or substance use disorders, whichever language you really want to use. Mm -hmm. and, and so when they're feeling bad about themselves, it's incredibly useful to have someone reach out a hand and say, you know, I know you're hurt, I know you're suffering, uh, I'm willing to help you and I care about you as a, as a person. Uh, that, those those are, are, are powerful and important things. One of the things that, that substance use tends to do is it tends to isolate us. And part of that's a brain issue and part of that's a social issue. So socially, uh, you tend to get marginalized, but, but brain-wise, and, and, and I don't think we talk about this enough, people who are actively using substances on a regular basis are really uh, reducing their capacity to connect to. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, substances uh, are a significant uh, inhibitors in terms of emotions. Uh, which is why people like them. The limbic system is the part of the brain that, that processes and manages emotions, and it is significantly impacted by, uh, by all drug use. And so people lose capacity to care. And often that's where some of the stigma comes from, because they're looked at like somebody who doesn't care instead of somebody who has lost that capacity. So mm -hmm. helping someone recognize that they're worth uh, your time and uh, worth listening to, but at the same time, helping them see that there's, there's things that can happen that can make their life a little bit better. I mean, really, if you're, uh, if you're heavily addicted to something, you've put your, you're, you're in a prison. Mm -hmm. And most people don't really like that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and so part of what uh, harm reduction programs can do is help people recognize that there are other options, there's other alternatives. And, you know, I've said for a long time when, uh, when you're taking something away from somebody, particularly the only thing that they have that makes them feel okay, you better have something else there that looks fairly attractive. Uh, like housing is a, is a good example. Uh, you know, if if you're willing to start to look at your substance use, that shows us that uh, it it would become practical to help you get into some really stable housing with some uh, stable food supply, so that you can start feeling better. You know, having having someone with a, a highly active addiction and just like sticking them in an apartment or sticking them in a, in a in a house on their own is likely not going to have a really great outcome yeah. but if if you can help them uh decrease their substance use get on uh some like you know opiates are a good example opiate replacement therapy mm -hmm. so that they're not constantly dealing with those cravings then uh then you can start to help them care enough about themselves that they want to uh, build things up a little bit better. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, there, there's always a, a segment of a population that just simply isn't going to get better. Yeah. And then, you know, it's really, you know, just using as much compassion and management as you can to help and, them. And what does that look like? I was that that's where I was going to go with you next. Now, there are people in in our communities that that have no desire to to stop using um problematically so what what is to become of them do they deserve to be in the back alleys and and everything just because they they choose not to stop using substances well i don't think anybody deserves to be in a back alley and but i'm also not sure that that people are totally committed to continuing to use if they can see that there's another option. Like it, it, it's a full-time job with very limited benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, like you're constantly uh, struggling to just try and feel okay. I mean, one of the things that, that I think helps people is to realize that, that they don't have to totally stop and that's that's one of the beauties of the the harm reduction programs 
that use methadone and suboxone is they they take away that that huge craving that you have for the drug use and unfortunately lots of them stop there and they don't provide the uh, the trauma support to help the person start to deal with the things that hurt because mm-hmm. I think you know most substance use comes from uh, maladaptive stress management about something so you know you were assaulted by your parents or grew up in a house where you know there there was no stability and you're constantly anxious even before you understand what anxiety is mm-hmm. and and discover and it's typically around 12 or 13 you discover that hey if i smoke some weed or drink some alcohol uh, that feeling that I wasn't even sure I had stops. And the perception is from the inside, I feel better. But the, the reality is that you actually feel less, like yeah. what whatever was hurting stopped. And so uh, the, the opiate replacement therapy is really good for, for stopping the cravings and managing that, that constant struggle that you have for more. Mm-hmm. But if you don't at the same time help that person learn some ways to start to let go of the hurt, whether it's uh, through talk therapy or CBT or mindfulness or whatever, there's lots and lots of different options to, to help people and to try and get them engaged and feeling better. Typically what will happen is they'll, they'll look to another drug mm-hmm. to uh, help to, to continue to dampen the emotions. Yeah. And so that's why I'm always kind of pushing for sort of like really encompassing care. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, financially, uh, there's always benefits to helping people move into recovery. Like it saves everybody mm-hmm. money in terms of people that are really stuck. Uh, the managed alcohol programs are a really good example of 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 that working for the most tell us a bit part. About, tell us a bit about those. What, are, what does that look like? What that looks like is people with, with uh, chronic alcohol use disorder who really uh, are not really able to function. Instead of them having to, uh, to panhandle or, or steal or uh, give all their food money away so that they can get alcohol, uh, they go into a, uh, a center or a site and are given uh, an amount of alcohol that, that keeps them from going into alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal is really uncomfortable. It's probably mm. in some ways worse than heroin withdrawal. And, you know, everybody sort of has this picture of, of, of the horrors of heroin withdrawal. But, but alcohol withdrawal is really ugly. Like there's uh, there's there's physical issues. There's huge risk of seizure, but there's always there's also incredible agitation. Like you do, you feel like uh, uh, like your life, and I'm not making fun of you, is totally unmanageable. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, there's a, there's a good story behind my behind my uh, oh, my stage oh, name, no, so to speak. I, so <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I'm aware. Uh, I just thought you needed a little poke there. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and so if if you know that, that three or four times a day you can go in and get enough alcohol to kind of stabilize yourself, then you then you can relax because not being able to to soothe the the physical addiction that comes from a lot of these drugs is like not being able to breathe. It's mm-hmm. like somebody's holding their hand over your mouth and nose and and uh, robbing you of the capacity to breathe. It's a and huge totally. physiological need. Yeah. So how is and that? So, how is that? How is that not unlike a safe consumption site that so many are advocating for? Uh, well, uh, because the safe consumption site doesn't necessarily uh, provide the drugs i mean people are bringing in whatever they want so managed alcohol site people know what they're getting and know what they're giving uh safe consumption sites certainly are a place where people can go and if they od there's somebody there to help them and again Mm -hmm. 
you know, helping people not die is useful, but they don't seem to be focused on uh, engaging the person. You know, if they if they were, or if they do, then I then I think those can be useful as well. Mm -hmm. And and saying, hey, you know, instead of doing this, we can help you get on methadone, or we can help you get on suboxone, or mm -hmm. we can get you into a medical detox so that you can get past that really uncomfortable. Uh, withdrawal period with some medical support so it doesn't feel like you're totally going to come apart you know i well, don't correct, and, oh hang sorry, on a sec just correct me if i'm wrong or misinformed here but isn't does a prairie harm do that sorry my my things in my ears uh, doesn't prairie harm basically uh, practice that approach uh, I know I, I know they've transitioned into doing more of that i think initially okay. they weren't but I believe that um, the last year or so, they've been doing more of that. And, you know, if, as, as long as we're helping people look at uh, changing, then, then I think we're doing the right thing. Like I, I, I've used harm reduction for a long time with kids and, and cannabis use. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I'm talking to a kid who's smoking weed twice a day and they've been doing that for six months the idea of suddenly stopping is going to terrify them mm -hmm. so uh if we can start to create a harm reduction plan that's working and so you know from twice a day to once a day to oh you know over a couple of weeks to then to every other day over another couple of weeks mm -hmm. then you're effectively reducing the harm I mean, my goal is always to get people off, particularly teens, because their brains are so uh, important. That, I mean, what's going on with their brains is so, so important at that age that mm -hmm. any substance use starts to interfere with that natural developmental process. And, and so my goal is always to get them off. Mm -hmm. But if I don't do that with some compassion and understanding, they're not going to even want to talk to me. So what do you so, do? What do you do with the people? So you you said earlier that we can't take something away without giving something back. So yeah. you're expecting you're expecting the teens you work with to like you just said essentially wean off of of these substances particularly marijuana you were speaking of there. What do you give back to them when you're taking when you're taking the substance away? What do you replace that with? Uh, sometimes with exercise, sometimes with whatever else their passion is. So uh, I was talking to a girl today who's a really good artist, and and she recognized that she could start to to draw more uh, to deal with her cravings. Mm -hmm. I've had kids exercise more. I uh, kids rarely leave me without a couple of new meditation tools to try to either to help them sleep or to help them reduce anxiety because mm -hmm. like like we were talking earlier most drug use uh, and alcohol is a drug too is a maladaptive stress response so people start to feel stress and somewhere along their life they learn that hey if i smoke weed or have a couple of drinks or or uh, uh, a line of this or that my perception of stress is reduced. It doesn't fix anything. And most people recognize that it doesn't fix anything, but, uh, but it goes away for a little while. And if we look at the, at the neurochemistry of that, as soon as we start to do that, uh, we start to dysregulate our brain function. And then it, it ca causes a whole domino effect of more craving, more drug seeking, and then uh, uh, because it uh, disrupts dopamine, as soon as dopamine starts to drop down, there's what's called a with, uh, negative withdrawal affect that takes place, which is dysphoria, which is kind of a broad-based term for sort of types of depression and low mood, mm -hmm. uh, irritability, anxiety, and malaise, which is slow motivation. And... Uh, like that happens to everybody with everything that you're doing too much of. Mm. And, and then those, those negative affects very quickly become uh, what triggers the craving. Mm. 
and so you get caught in a cycle. So, so really what I'm always trying to do is slow down the cycle and then break the cycle. So by using meditation, by using exercise, like I was talking to a kid yesterday and they have a dog. And so part of her replacement therapy is she's going to take the dog for a walk. Hmm. Uh, and, and that actually feels good. And then the, the other thing is, uh, uh, well, there's a couple of things, like how it's presented. If it's presented like this is a way to learn how to get your own happy back, to learn mm -hmm. how to get feeling better about yourself, as opposed to you just have to stop this stuff because it's bad. If, if they feel that this is going to actually help them feel better, then you're creating a better opportunity for their mind to open up to change. Mm. That's, got a I mean, that's really in. what we're doing. Got a comment coming in from Barb. Barb says, having a safer supply available at consumption sites and referrals to multiple options would be rad. There's no supply at PHR, but they can drug test on site. Yeah, so, and I, like I think, drug, I think being able to test drugs is important because there's mm -hmm. some really toxic stuff out there. Mm hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the legalization of marijuana. What, have you seen any change? <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you seen any like trends that like have increased use or an increased use in certain demographics since the legalization rolled out? Uh, yes, I've seen a significant increase in use in adolescence uh, and uh, use of much stronger products. One of the things that, that, um, uh, legalization did was it opened up a whole bunch of new product markets both in edibles and the distillates like there's dab pens and cart pens and all of these sort of really slick little devices that uh, allow a much quicker quicker and easier and less noticeable access to cannabis and mm. it doesn't smell designed I mean, to mess you, know, you up 10 years ago yeah, and the you know the the THC strength in those things is typically about eighty percent, so That's it's almost crazy. like a different drug. Well, it is. Yeah, you know, like, like I know like, I know any strain of marijuana. Like back in my day, like if it hit thirty percent, that was like that was top shelf stuff. Like that would mess me up, right? Well, yeah. Well, so. and and now most of the bud is between twenty five and thirty five. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so that stronger. And, uh, uh, I mean, just the, the other thing that goes on with that is the higher the THC, the lower the CBD. And CBD has some uh, uh, mellowing effects on the, uh, on the effects of THC. So the, these highly refined products are just THC. Mm -hmm. So I often compare it to, you know, the sort of old weed stuff is like drinking a beer. And this new stuff is like having like six shots of Everclear moonshine <laughs> yeah um yeah. so it's so it's so it's much stronger so so that's that's one issue and mm. and the uh, the addictive potential increases with the strength of something so and the younger you are when you start the more likely it is that it that it's going to become a problem so mm. like i'm seeing lots of kids in grade nine who have been using uh, cannabis for a year and are exhibiting some of the problems that you, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't see uh, uh, till kids got to grade 12. And so uh, the accessibility is increased a lot. There seems to be uh, a, a almost unlimited access, not a, not a lot dis uh, different from alcohol. But it's it's so much easier to use cannabis now than it is to use alcohol because it it doesn't smell. There's not that immediate noticeable effect of being drunk, you know, which we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. And and the thinking around cannabis use is really interesting because nobody questions using every day. Most people uh, like if you look at alcohol. Most people recognize that if you're drinking every day to the point of 
you know, feeling impaired, uh, maybe there's something the matter. Mm -hmm. Or if you're drinking in the morning, may maybe maybe that's not okay. But with, with cannabis, for whatever reason, you know, getting up and having a hoot uh, uh, doesn't seem like uh, that fits into people's uh, view of what a problem is. Mm -hmm. And so the, the problem escalates really, really quickly. Yeah. And again, it's, it's really tied to, to stress issues. It's really tied to, you know, how kids are feeling. And you know, when you're young and if you're feeling anxious or you're feeling uh, socially inept or, or whatever, and you smoke some weed or drink some alcohol, and that feeling goes away, that's instantly attractive. Mm -hmm. but I, like, I don't want to get like too technical, but I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs is a really interesting analysis tool for this. Because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first stage is physiological needs. We have to meet those first. And then after that is safety needs. And, uh, and then after that is connection and love and belonging. And most of the time, substance use starts in that, in that connection area. You're with your friends. Uh, somebody pulls out a bag of weed, says, hey, you want to try this? Mm -hmm. And you do. Just maybe you didn't want to, but you do because everybody else is doing it. Uh, and for about 65% of the population, it's kind of whatever. But if there's something the matter, but I mean, there's, there's a huge body of research on adverse childhood experience on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what happened to you when you're growing up. And if there's a bunch of negative things, and it doesn't have to be a lot, your fight, flight, or hide stress response system is constantly activated, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you have a, like, who to weed, and that stops. And ho. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And the other thing that happens almost instantaneously is you've rewired your reward system. So the next time that you feel stress, your little brain, not that it's that little, but, but your brain is saying, hey, do that again, because that worked. Yeah. And then you do it again, and you start to really cement in that, that pathway of that's the solution to stress. And then at, the, and so that's the equivalent of paying somebody else to go to the gym for you. Mm -hmm. And so your natural stress response system weakens. And so more and more things start to feel stressful, which become more and more reasons to go have another hoot. Mm -hmm. And then. So Go ahead. Sorry. I can go on. I'll go on forever. So interrupt <laughs> me whenever you want. <laughs> Do you ever think cannabis harms will surpass um, alcohol harms? I think they are in high schools now. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because I know, like, and it's a conversation that nobody really seems to be wanting to have, but alcohol seems to be doing more harms to our society than than all of the other substances combined. And um, when when we look at it through that lens, it really makes me start to question, like, if, if that is the benchmark that that we're looking for for all substances, what harms are, are yet to come? You know, well, uh, you know, I think if we if we look chronologically, the the extent of substance problems in our society are constantly increasing. And. Uh, and you're right, like, like alcohol is still killing way more people than opiate overdoses. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't hear about the, uh, the people who are dying from alcohol things unless they get in a car crash or something. Mm -hmm. But like the last CIHR data that came out, like 77,000 people in Canada were hospitalized for alcohol related issues. This isn't showing up drunk. This is like like significant health harms related to uh, drinking too much for too long. Uh, for a couple of reasons, I think there's so much uh, accept, acceptance of alcohol that uh, people want to protect it. And so it's really easy if you're a drinker, even if you're drinking too much, Mm -hmm. to look at an opiate problem and say, well, I don't do opiates, so I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you and, think it's the regulation 
of alcohol? Like, do you think that because it's legal, because you can go to a bar or a liquor store and get it, do you think that there's a direct correlation between availability and harms? I think, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. If you look back to the alcohol prohibition era, uh, there were significantly fewer health harms related to alcohol than there is now. There were more social harms because there was bootlegging and gangs and, and legal issues like that, but the health harms were not anywhere near per capita the way that they are now because there weren't as many people drinking as much alcohol. The drinking was sort of more underground. Uh, uh, kind of underground and secularized almost. Um, so secularized. What does that mean? Well, it, it, uh, in certain groups, like uh, there would be groups of people who, you know, knew how to get into the speakeasy and knew where to get the alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more of a sort of cultural pockets of, of alcohol use and and not as publicly available. So uh, so if you look at that whole uh, decriminalization discussion, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know when I when I heard people talking about that, they were talking about uh, Portugal, and Portugal did a really uh, uh, phenomenal social uh, uh, engineering project based around substance problems. And but uh, I think it was about a year ago that there was a huge uh, sort of public push that we got to decriminalize everything. Because if we decriminalize everything, that's going to uh, solve the uh, overdose problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the criminalization piece, I don't think, really has anything to do with it. Uh, people are going to get what they're going to get. Uh, yeah. And so if, uh, you know, if you legalized hydrocodone and you can go to the store and get as much hydrocodone as you want, you still get people dying of overdoses of that. Uh, just like you get people dying of overdoses of alcohol. But, you know, I'm gonna, uh, let me interrupt didn't... you right there before I forget, and I apologize. But I have, was having a conversation with Nathaniel Day last week. He was on the show. And he said that almost that same thing. He's like, um, he recently, uh, two, two kids uh, tragically lost their lives to a fentanyl poisoning when they were smoking weed that they obtained on the black market and and marijuana has been legalized for some time now so it, it would it would appear well, yeah. that the it would appear that the legal supply is not displacing the illicit supply well i mean i i talk to uh probably 10 kids a day so 50 kids a week individually mm -hmm. and and one of the questions i always ask is are you getting uh store weed or are you getting weed from somebody else and most of them are saying they're getting weed from stores oh. so uh in in that culture there's a there's a lot less black market use and and it's interesting because well a couple of things they think it's safer and, and it is one of the likely. Th one, well it, uh, it's it's less likely that it's going to be contaminated adultery although if you yeah uh, if you look at the number of uh, products that have been taken off the shelves uh, because they were full of mold or had pesticide in them or herbicides in them that they weren't supposed to have in them, uh, that, there's tons of marijuana that's been pulled out of the legal production market uh, uh, simply uh, because it wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. But at least somebody's checking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's some checking going on, so there's some there's some control. Yeah. But I mean, the 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 issue with that is because it's legal, there's reduced risk risk perception. Mm -hmm. So if it's you know it's that a sort of thing. If it's legal, it's okay. But like back to the Portugal mm -hmm. issue, they didn't just decriminalize everything before they decriminalized anything. They created a, a really solid network of detox and treatment centers so that uh, when people ran into trouble with a substance, uh, uh, like a, a legal issue or a health issue, uh, they were immediately offered uh, 
uh, detox and treatment. And then coming out of treatment, they were offered a job. And, and so dealing with your substance issue, what unfolded in front of you was a whole bunch of opportunities to have a better life. And, mm. and, you know, and I, and I think in lots of ways, we're missing that, you know, we're, we're, we're still kind of stuck with what, like, you have to stop. And, you know, even in the, in the treatment field, uh, in the health districts, so although we're like, we're, I, I know there's lots of work happening to get this better, but mm -hmm. for a long time it was, okay, go to detox, go to treatment, and then off you go. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I've, uh, I've heard and, actually, um, you know what, now that I've interrupted you, uh, it brings to mind, why don't we take just a quick break here and hear a word from tonight's sponsors. Good idea. Now that I've left Prairie Sky, I, I, I just feel free from my addiction. Treatment saved my life. Prairie Sky Recovery saved my life. I, I, well, I, I'll just throw a plug in for Prairie Sky. I've, I've been out there, I've uh, done some programs with them. It's a great place. It's a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they do good work out there. So. Yeah. I'm actually going out there next week. I'm going to take a bunch of uh, Dark Side Donuts out there and uh, share a little bit, of my, little bit of my story before Christmas. So Nice. Yeah, yeah. And they also have a, a wonderful recovery day celebration in the summertime, too, if you all want to check that out. It's yeah. camping and fires and music and all sorts of things. So, so anyways. And they, have, um, and they have their new women's center, too, which is mm -hmm. awesome. It's amazing. Starlight House. Yeah, no, uh, Donna was the MC for the for the grand opening of, of, uh, of that house. Was, Super uh, honored. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So so where were we now? I interrupted you with intent and All then over I, the place. Yeah, I squirreled well, out in about Portugal. Right. Right. I was talking right. about Portugal and then I and then I was morphing into the lack of of uh continuing care platforms uh in our province around addiction. And I and I also said that there's some significant work on on getting that better. Because mm -hmm. uh uh I think, you know, if we under if we understand that that addiction isn't just about the drug use. The drug use is about other problems that a person is having. If we just take away the drugs and don't help them understand A, what the problem was and B, how to manage things better, then there's a pretty good chance you're just going to end up going back into the same problem again. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, effective treatment needs to be much longer term. And that doesn't mean that they have to be in a residential treatment center for, you know, for years, but mm -hmm. there needs to be uh, some coordinated aftercare programming that a person can, can participate in. Yeah. Like I do, I do aftercare work with people from several treatment centers around the country. And we meet every two weeks and uh, there's an education piece to that. So we, you know, we teach something about how to enhance your recovery, how to get happier, how to deal with stress better. Mm -hmm. What uh, to do with your time. Yeah. What to do with your time. Yeah. What, how to, uh, watch out for bad thinking, which, you know, which tends to get you into trouble. And, you know, I've, I've got, uh, a few people that have been doing that consistently for three years now because they they find that valuable and and they're also doing other stuff like they're doing yoga or they're going to 12 step stuff or they're whatever uh this this isn't uh an easy thing to fix yeah and i you know i think the most important thing and I said it a few minutes ago, but I'll say it again. It isn't about just stopping the drug use. And I think, uh, I think that's where people who are in those sort of extreme cases who are using harm reduction services are afraid of, that they're going to just make me stop and they're not going to give me anything else mm -hmm. that's going to make me feel okay. And mm -hmm. so building that... Uh, a understanding and secondly compassion into yeah no we we get this we 
you know, we want you to be happy. We want you to be free. We don't want you to have to uh, spend three quarters of your day trying to find enough money or find enough mm -hmm. drugs for you to be okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, so, so Portugal created the treatment centers, the detox centers, and the the mechanism that one person got into either a health issue, uh, so ended up in the hospital uh, with an overdose or ended up in a legal issue about uh, drug use, they were given the option of going through this treatment tr treatment program. And then coming out of the treatment program, part of their aftercare program was getting them uh, back into society by giving them a job. And the, and the mm -hmm. government actually funded the employers, I think six months of this person's salary uh, so that they could get into that, get trained and start to uh, contribute back. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the things that really helps people get better is when that they realize that they can help somebody else. Yeah. Like I, I had a, uh, a kid today uh, pop in to see me at one of my schools and like you said I just wanted to thank you because you helped me understand that I needed to leave this stuff alone and he said that feels really good but he said the thing that feels really good is that that I'm I'm starting to influence my friends because they're they're seeing that hey you know you've got way more energy you seem happier you're doing better at school and and he's really clear with them well it's because i stopped smoking dope every day yeah you know and i i heard a uh uh somebody said to me i believe it was rob rob tenge he said to me the yeah. the best thing that i have ever seen in overcoming substance use challenges is a fulfilling and meaningful life having yeah. something having something meaningful to do you know, with for for me, when I came out of treatment and and perhaps I was in a place of privilege because my mother's been working in the addictions field in Saskatchewan here for now near forty years, um, I was able to get into uh, an aftercare program that was a sober living house, Trache House, here in Saskatoon, run by Comfy, yeah. and I was yeah I was subject to weekly you know urine tests and case planning, and I was expected to go to meetings and you know, but even even then. I was sort of on my own and, and maybe that's the way it should be. But, you know, like I, ha I ended up going to like two meetings every day because I just didn't know what else to do with myself. You know, do you think that yeah. there's a do you think that that should be a part of, you know, like, OK, here's a safe place to sleep, but you got to go and find your own shit to do during the day? Or do you think there should be more structure involved? Well, no, I like I, um, I've, I've said for a long time that you can't just take people out of treatment and say, here you go. Mm -hmm. uh it it and i said if you're teaching somebody to walk across the street for a while you hold their hand while you're walking across the street mm -hmm. and then you walk beside them walking across the street and then you watch them walk across the <laughs> yeah. street yeah um so that you know that they're going to be okay that's and, a great and, analogy and if um if if people knew how to be okay, you know what they'd be doing? They'd be okay, but mm -hmm. they don't know. Um, like the, so much of, of, of what happens with chronic substance problems is we don't learn how to be okay without it. We don't learn anything. We just learn mm -hmm. how to survive. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a huge uh, learning curve emotionally, socially, culturally about how to be okay uh uh substance free like mm -hmm. i was I, like i um i was 23 when i sobered up and emotionally i was probably about 14 yeah but i had a, I, you know i had a degree i uh i guess sobered up in march and started teaching in september uh and and so i had an education and i had a job but i didn't really know how to be because I, you know, most of my life up to that point, I had mm. not been present, like I'd mm. been on something. And, and so, you know, those first couple of years, 
and like you i i, I was in a in a privileged position because i had an education and i had a job so you know i had a place to live uh, but but learning how to uh, understand how i felt and learning how to manage my life mm -hmm. uh, uh, was a challenge and so you know without the resources i had even though i was kind of you know uh, in a way on my own without those resources it's rich it's difficult mm -hmm. got a comment coming in here from uh terry terry thank you for the comment terry says i sink myself into my work i now have two jobs and did an electrician aptitude test today. Change is good. Staying busy is better than not. Rand, I weigh about the same as I did when I left HS high school. That was a long time ago. You know, there's an old saying uh, in, in the program, and it says, you need a big book and a lunch bucket. You think there's some truth to that? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I heard that a lot, too. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I think having a purpose is incredibly important. And if you don't have something to do that matters to you, uh, then, you know, I think you're missing something. Like I'm, uh, uh, I retired in 2001 for two months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you then, were younger and then. then <laughs> so full and, of life. And then, yeah. And then uh, somebody, one of the superintendents said, Hey, do you want to come back and just uh, work with kids that, you know, in all the schools that are having drug and alcohol issues? And I said, Sure. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd do that for a while. And I'm still doing it. Yeah. Because it's absolutely fascinating. I love it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I, I feel like I have a purpose and I feel like I'm doing something that's useful. Like like mm -hmm. that kid today who popped in and said, you know, I just want to thank you for helping me figure this out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so so having a purpose is valuable. Yeah. And, you, uh, you, you keep you keep talking about about kids, about teenagers. Um, I think we're uh, getting towards the end here. So I think it's important that we talk about this book that you've written about uh, addiction and teens. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? Well, sure. It's called Which Way to Turn? Uh, Understanding Adolescent Substance Use. Uh, and I and I wrote it. Uh, uh, it's sort of a compilation of, of everything that I've learned and come to have come to understand about this stuff, but also a bit of a blueprint about how I work with kids. And I wrote it for uh, for parents, for teachers, for mm -hmm. other clinicians who are working with kids or trying to figure out what the heck's going on with kids. And it, it and it looks at it looks a lot at two things. It looks at the underlying issues, like the kinds of things that trigger the stress. And I don't like I got to stop using that word trigger because it puts us in a victim position mm. that create stress. And then we find maladaptive ways to get out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also talk a lot in there about the brain chemistry piece because that's really important. Dopamine is a, a fundamental neurotransmitter that that's responsible for motivation. It's responsible for a lot of pleasure. It's really responsible for processing. And as soon as we start doing too much of anything, uh, and it's interesting, I was talking to uh, like 150 grade 12s today, and, and I said like heavy use of cannabis is once a week. And you could see eyes get big. <laughs> and then and and then and then I said, and chronic chronic use is twice a week, and then more eyes got bigger because mm -hmm. uh, there's real misperceptions on, on how much is too much. But uh, that those are very true with that drug because it has such a long half life. But anything that's that's bumping our dopamine up really high, it causes automatic dopamine down regulation. And then our brain's in a fight trying to get itself back into normal. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the term is homeostasis. And when it's out of, out of normal, it's allostasis or allostatic. And, and 
Uh, it wants to be level. And when we're constantly creating uh, highs, there's an automatic low that happens. And then we start treating the low. And, and so drugs do it, but so does too much social media. Can I tell you a TikTok story? I would love to hear a TikTok story. Okay. So uh, I've been dealing with kids for like a couple of years. Mm -hmm. who uh, are spending like six, eight, ten hours a day looking at TikTok. You know, they're lying in bed at night till two or three in the morning looking at TikTok. And then it can hardly get up to go to school and can't function at school because they're so tired. So I didn't really understand what TikTok was. So I put TikTok on my phone. <laughs> and, and, and I started looking at, at these TikToks. And she's laughing because she knows where this is going. I, I so, honestly didn't realize what TikTok was until Grady started kind of dabbling around with it. And I'm like a bit of a helicopter parent, and I had a look at what he was. And I was like, what are you watching? Done. Uninstalled. <laughs> and now Don is well, up till 3 o'clock in the morning some, on TikTok. <laughs> no. There's some no, good she's... stuff on there. But anyway. Mm. I'm on there. We're on there. So yeah, for sure. But yeah. for like a so, kid, yeah, mm -mm. yeah. Well, anybody. I mean, so like, I'm not a kid. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm not a kid. <laughs> oh, uh, don't be like that. So, You're as old as you feel. Yeah, twelve. Um, <laughs> so I so I put TikTok on my phone and I started flipping through these things, and uh, and there was a, a TikTok of a guy with a chainsaw cutting down a tree. And I have chainsaws and I live in the country and I cut down trees. So I watched it and like I watched the whole thing and I liked it. And then I started to get more TikToks of uh, people with chainsaws, sometimes doing really stupid things with chainsaws and other times complicated, interesting things. Uh, and then I got one of a uh, uh, sheepdog herding sheep, which always fascinates me. And I liked that. And then How I started you know? to get some more of Pardon? I don't How know. How did it know? It just, well, I think it was, well, I, th I think it was just accidental, but mm, I'm not no. sure. But, you know, I, like I've looked at them on other platforms. Mm. So YouTube or whatever, you know, and I think there's a connection, but so I got a few more of those. And then I looked at my clock. I've been doing that for 40 minutes. And I'm somebody that, you know, that, that, doesn't have a lot of time to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you're ranting. You don't get addicted to nothing. <laughs> well, I, well, no, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> I'm careful about what I do. Yeah. I, so I said, oh, Jesus, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliantly designed. Diabolical to might get be a better term. To, <laughs> to get people addicted. And then I said, I'm going to stop. And my brain said, watch one more. No, mm -hmm. it didn't. <laughs> it did. It said, just, just watch one more. See what's next. Cause that, mm -hmm. that's anticipatory dopamine. Mm -hmm. You know, what's next, what's going to come up next. And I didn't. And I felt bad. Hmm. So that immediate down regulation was right there, like really quick. And okay. So, but I liked it. The, you know, there were some things about it I liked. So mm -hmm. I, I limited myself to five TikToks a day. So this is and, a thing now. This is a thing that you're making a decision. I'm only going to do five a day. Yeah, yeah. I'm, go I'm, gonna, I'm going to moderate control what it. I'm doing. I'm going to control it because I like it. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at it every day. But if I do, uh, uh, I typically will stick to that five. But then I started making TikToks. Oh no! <laughs> so, so I uh, I'm I'm really into mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I over the summer I made several sort of just sort of mindful breathing, walking, looking at nature TikToks, mm -hmm. and then uh, I send out a a thought for the day with a photo that I take and. Um, 
uh, and a quote by somebody smarter than me. I've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started putting those, like I, they're on Instagram, on Facebook, drug class Facebook page. And I send out an email, I got an email list. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I started putting them on, on TikTok too. And, and then I look at it a few days later and like 300 people looked at it. I thought, cool. There's the fix. You know, well, and, and so that's a bit of, but, but I'm really careful about that. Like I've mm -hmm. got four Facebook pages and uh, Instagram and I rarely look at feedback. You know, if somebody asks me a question, I'll answer it, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't count up hearts or likes or really value that too much. You know, I guess to sum up what I've wanted to talk about tonight, I, I've talked about, so I've talked about kids, I've talked about how much is too much. Uh, we had, I think, a pretty useful discussion about harm reduction and how it mm -hmm. needs to be an evolutionary process to really help guide people to get better, because I don't think they know. And I don't, mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't think they know that they want, would, would like that. You know, mm -hmm. they get stuck, you know, you know what you know. Oh, and, but and you I start can, to show, I, if I you can start relate. to show people, hey, you know, if you go through that door, there's some pretty cool stuff there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in order to get through that door, you're going to have to do this or that. So, and it might suck a you know, bit for a while. Well, yeah. Or it'll be different at least. Mm -hmm. cool man anyway this was fun yeah no i appreciate you coming on sharing your expertise with uh with us um is is there anything else you'd like to say before we let you go well no other than i'd be happy to do this again because there's lots of stuff i like to talk about oh, and well. and like my my passion is educating people mm -hmm. um that's really what i like to do and i think that's kind of where my strength is is like I learn stuff and then I find ways to make it make sense to other people. Mm -hmm. awesome. And that's what I've really tried to do with that book. So, yeah. Cool, man. Well, let's, it's, let's on, keep... Am it's on Amazon and, and uh, McNally Robinson in Saskatoon mm -hmm. and warehouse books in Regina. Can you um, run the title e by me again? Yeah. It's called which way to turn understanding adolescent substance use. Donna's going to look up a link, throw it in the chat. Okay. Cool. All right, Rand. Well, yeah, let, let's keep talking. Um, uh, I, I would love to have you on platform uh, more often talking about, you got a wealth of knowledge, man. It's uh, important to share it. So uh, it's what happens when you're old. You learn, you get to know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Well, we'll let you go. Uh, take care, my friend. We'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. All right, if you're getting something out of what we're doing here tonight, you can find all our audios on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts, or live and interactive right here on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch TV. Thanks for watching. Take care, everybody. We will see you next time. Say, hey, this is Hard Knocks Talks. <laughs>